Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News. Here's what we have in the bulletin. Controversial Member of Parliament Everald Warmington withdraws resignation. Government announces plans to expand a poor relief program and changes to its department. And later in sports, Jamaica defeat Panama to place third in CONCACAF Nations League. Thank you for joining us. I'm Karian Simpson. Here are the details. Controversial Member of Parliament for Southwestern St. Catherine Everald Warmington has withdrawn his resignation as Chairman of the JLP's Area 2. He resigned earlier this month after revealing that he was sacked as Minister with Responsibility for Works. This over his comments about withholding money from the PNP councillor. However, in an about turn, he has written to party executives withdrawing his resignation, adding that he is fully committed to working for the re-election of the Jamaica Labour Party as a government and, and, and Mr. Andrew Holness as Prime Minister. A lack of transparency and undermining the laws. That's how one attorney has described the issue of the non-tabling of reports in Parliament. Nicole Gordon weighed in on the issue on Radio Jamaica's That's a Wrap program on Sunday. Auditor General Pamela Monroe Ellis has indicated that two reports that were returned to her office on Friday by House Speaker Juliet Holness would be resubmitted to Parliament on Monday. Those two reports, a special audit of the Financial Services Commission and a special audit of Tax Administration Jamaica, were sent to Parliament on December 28 last year and January 29 this year. While not giving a reason for the return, Mrs. Monroe Ellis indicated that she will be dispatching them back to Parliament. This development comes after General Secretary of the Governing Jamaica Labour Party, Dr. Horace Chang, stated that as of Friday, there was no outstanding report from either the Integrity Commission or the Auditor General awaiting tabling in Parliament. Attorney at Law Nicole Gordon is calling it counterproductive. What the law is doing, you know, is it's, it's setting in place, it's entrenching systems of good governance. That's what it's trying to do. And my issue is that if it is that the law is trying to entrench these pillars of good governance, what we're talking about, the two months means you must be efficient. Tabling, tabling it in parliament means that you must be transparent and accountable. Those are the pillars. If it is that you are acting in ways that are antithetical to those pillars, it means that you are discrediting your governance. She says the approach taken by the government is not in compliance with transparency and undermines the laws and policies in place to ensure integrity. You can't act in those ways. That is the problem that I'm having with the approach that is taken. Because if you take an approach that you are respecting, not just the legal imperative that government has, but the moral imperative of government, you behave differently. TVJ News understands that the police have and will be increasing their presence across several major intersections and public spaces across the country. It's understood that the strategy is intended to minimize incidents of public disorder. Police sources revealed that in addition to foot patrols, officers will also be utilizing bicycles. It's further understood that the officers assigned will come from a new police division, which will be created in the Public Safety and Traffic Enforcement Branch, PSTEB. Now, when asked, the police, a senior police official said, unlike previous occasions, there will be sustained presence in critical areas. The source, however, declined to comment regarding the new division. As hundreds of people try to escape the crisis situation in Haiti, we take a look at what it takes to get people out of the country. Now, as you will hear from the CNN, it's a dangerous journey. The challenge for U.S. citizens trying to leave Port-au-Prince begins as soon as they start driving to the U.S. Embassy. Getting there involves driving through either gang-controlled or gang-contested territories. It's dangerous and it's unpredictable. In armored vehicles, we saw that firsthand. And yet, this is the only way out for some. The airport is shut down and many feel trapped. In recent days, the U.S. Embassy began evacuating citizens who could make it to the embassy. Managing the safety of those evacuations is Regional Security Officer Steve Strickland. How does Haiti, how does Port-au-Prince 
today compared to your past 19 years? There's nothing like Port-au-Prince. The security situations here are nothing like anything I've experienced before. Um, I've spent time in Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan, uh, Iraq, um, in Africa. And uh, the, unique, uh, the unique circumstances here, um, I have not seen a parallel to those in any other uh, security environment that I've served. Amid these challenges, there are some who fear Americans are being abandoned in this gang-filled war zone. The truth of the matter is, literally on a daily basis, there are phone calls that we're engaged with at the highest levels of U.S. government, where the number one topic is safety and security. How do we help get our U.S. citizens uh, out, of, out of the country to a safe place? Launching these evacuation flights from the Capitol is a critical first step. Jenny Guillaume and her five-year-old son, Conrad, registered a few days ago. She's had to leave behind her mom and other loved ones so as to get back to their home in New York. Getting to the embassy is terrifying. It's a potentially deadly commute. Some who had confirmed their spots canceled last minute, either emotionally unable to leave behind loved ones or just unable to get to the embassy safely. So is there an option to go from here and go pick them up? Is that even a reality? It just really isn't, unfortunately. The, the security resources that we have are stretched so thin. The ability to, to do that um, is, is it's really a non-starter. We just don't have uh, that, that capacity to do it. We'd love to do it. It's just simply an impossibility, unfortunately. With some seats unclaimed at the last minute, our team, as U.S. citizens, is able to travel out with them and chronicle their journey. We board in gang-controlled territory on a patch of land that's secured and surrounded by a robust and reassuring American military presence. We take off for the Dominican Republic. There are a lot of mixed emotions for those who get out. Gratitude and relief for getting here safely, as well as guilt and fear for those still in Port-au-Prince. Knowing that what's happening on the other side of this border is getting worse with each passing hour. Residents and business operators along Grange Lane in Portmore, St. Catherine are this afternoon taking issue with construction being done on the thoroughfare. Work recently began on the roadway to expand it into a dual carriageway. But while the community members welcome the expansion, there are concerns. The concern is about the level that the road is being um, lifted, the height, and where the water is supposed to travel, as a concern to the residents and also the business operator along Grange Lane. The flooding is a major concern to the business operators along Grange Lane. So the water, so too high, so the water, so they have to create that um, channel to take away the water. And based on what they are seeing and the questions that they are asking, um, there is no plan to really take away that water more than the water is just going to just go in on the business operators. Mayor Leon Thomas says a meeting will be held with the National Works Agency, NWA, and the community members to discuss a solution. The NWF officials will be sending a letter inviting them to our meeting and we'll also engage the business operators so that they can ask their questions and the questions will be answered at that meeting. Not yet. We don't have a date for the meeting as yet. The government has announced plans to expand the poor relief program and introduce changes to its department. Local government minister Desmond McKenzie says further information will be provided when he speaks in the upcoming sectoral debate. I'll be making some announcements as it relates to expanding this program and about some of the changes that we are going to be putting into the poor relief department to uplift those persons who fall under the care of our poor relief. Do you want to speak about it now? In the meantime, the minister is urging mayors to treat poor relief officers better. I don't want any of them to make any complaints to me. That is the easiest part of your job supporting the work of poor relief. 
And who can deny the fact that probably five years time I will see one and two of them as counselors. It's time for a break. Stay with us. More stories when we return. Welcome back to the Midday News. As the Education Ministry looks to introduce integrated STEM teaching methodologies for students, more rural schools are getting involved. 61 institutions in St. Anne, from the early childhood to the tertiary level, are moving ahead with the STEM program to prepare students in the sciences. Carlin Segree is Director of Regional Educational Services for Region 3. What we're trying to do is to ensure that all our students and the teachers are cognizant of the STEM approach to teaching, the STEM approach to education. If we are going to really get towards national development, through our trend agenda through to achieve vision 2030 we have to get all our students and schools on board she says it's aimed at developing students love for the sciences to prepare them for national development it's on the the front burner of all our schools all our schools they teach science our teachers teach science we have of course in our high schools um, it's, it is high on the agenda on our timetables and, and an offering from the primary level. When asked if she believes the government is doing enough to invest in the sciences, she had this to say. One of the key pillars in the trend agenda is finance. It means that finance is high on the ministry's agenda. And so we are looking at the ministries, looking at our minister, our permanent secretary, our chief education officer. They're looking at um, other models and how we can fund education so that we can get the best out of our students, our teachers, and of course to see our principal's efforts maximized at the highest levels. In the meantime, Ms. Segree is encouraging parents and communities to come on board. This is one of the ministry's mandates in terms of the communicating with our stakeholders. Um, the expectation, the ministry's expectation is that we meet in quality education circles as we have met today because these are learning communities. It's time now for the Business Minute. Transport costs went up by 9.6% on an annual basis as at February this year. Looking at inflation for the month of February alone, transport costs increased by 0.3% compared to January. Statin says the latest contributor to the increase was a 1.1% increase in prices associated with operation of personal transport equipment this was linked to higher petrol prices. For the field, luxury fashion brand Hermes is facing a lawsuit alleging that its Birkin handbags are too hard to buy. Hermes produces a very limited number of Birkins per year, selling from $10,000 at retail but much more at auction. Two California customers in their lawsuit claim the way Hermes sells its bags is a violation of antitrust law. The complaint alleges, quote, customers who are deemed worthy of purchasing a Birkin handbag will be shown a Birkin handbag. The two customers claim they were told they had to have a spending history with the company, which means purchasing other Hermes items first to be eligible to buy its bag. To win, the lawsuit will have to prove that Hermes is a monopoly and that its product tying is illegal. Hermes has not commented on the matter. And that's it for the Business Minute. I am Kirk Wright. Time now for the top regional and international stories. In the region, Suriname and Guyana are moving forward with plans to construct a bridge over the Quarantine River, which is to link the two CARICOM countries. The presidents of both countries met on the weekend to discuss the mobilization of funding for the bridge, which is expected to be completed by 2026. The leaders say they anticipate that the bridge will foster people-to-people -people connections, bolster agricultural cooperation, facilitate trade and investment, and boost tourism, thereby contributing 
contributing to economic growth and prosperity for both countries. On the international scene, Israel and Hamas could soon swap hostages and prisoners after Israel agreed to a U.S. prisoner exchange proposal. The swap includes 40 Israeli hostages and around 700 Palestinian prisoners, which consists of 100 Palestinians serving life sentences for killing Israeli nationals. Israel is now awaiting for Hamas to respond. And at least 25 people are dead after heavy rains swept across the southeastern Brazil over the weekend. Over 5,000 people have been evacuated from their homes as authorities warn that more rain is on the way. Up to Sunday, rescuers in boats and aircraft were still searching for survivors under the debris. And those are the top regional and international stories. I'm Amoy Harriet. Thank you, Amoy. We head to a quick break. When we come back, we'll have your midday sports with Jordan Ford.